The next speaker is uh, Felix Schwarz from uh, Freiburg, talking about novel linkers for okay. anti-cancer protein conjugates. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Um, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to continue the albumin story. Um, uh, actually, when um, I started end of the 1990s, uh, Neil and I were not acquainted, um, and um, um, I had no idea what he was doing, and I don't think he had an idea what I was doing. Um, and um, probably this was because albumin wasn't on vogue as a drug carrier. So this is going to be the first part of my talk, and then I'll talk about uh, novel linkers for protein drug conjugates. Uh, this is a technology which uh, we developed um, around 1999. So it's a small molecule approach. Um, uh, a drug consisting of a protein binding group, a predetermined breaking point, and a drug is administered directly into the body. It binds to a specific amino acid on the surface of circulating albumin and a macromolecular prodrug is formed, and due to albumin uptake, EPR effect, and so on, it accumulates in the tumor, and then once it's taken up in the tumor tissue and in the tumor cells, it's released either by an acid-promoted mechanism or enzymatically. So the difference is to abrexane, it's a small molecule approach, it's a prodrug approach, it's uses endogenous albumin as a carrier, and it binds covalently to albumin. What aided us in the first design of our product, which went into the clinic, was um, that during the 1990s, a number of X-ray structures of albumin appeared. This is one uh, where you see the fatty, five fatty acids being bound to albumin. Um, also, you can see the copper uh, ion binding site and the zinc ion binding site. And this is the cysteine 34 position. Um, I can't show it to you because it's um, uh, not a model where you could see amino acids. But what I want to um, highlight is if you measure the tile concentration in blood, it's about 500 micromolar. And 90% of that tile content in blood is due to the cysteine 34 of circulating albumin. This shows now this cavity where the cysteine 34 sits in more detail. You're seeing both structures, the one with the fatty acid, which is more open, and the one without fatty acids. This cavity, that's the cysteine 34 here, is approximately 10 to 12 angstrom deep. Now, in, a, in your body, you have about, on average, two fatty acids bound to albumin. And that was the basis for designing the length of that linker. And what fitted best was a hexyl malamide. And for this reason, we used this in the design of our first acid-sensitive albumin-binding doxorubicin prodrug, uh, chemically the 6 malamido caparyl hydrosone derivative of doxorubicin, now named aldoxorubicin. So you see, this is the linker. This is the acid-sensitive hydrosone linked onto the C13 keto position, and that's uh, the well-known drug doxorubicin. What you're seeing here on the right is how it is applied in the clinic. It's reconstituted. It's a lyophilized powder with uh, lactated ringers and then administered over 30 minutes to patients. Um, we chose this drug because it had a very fast binding to endogenous albumin. Basically, when you inject it after a minute, everything is bound to that position. And uh, we have, meanwhile, in at least 10 mouse models, xenograft models, but also a, a rat model um, with tumor-bearing tumors shown very good effects, superior effects versus doxorubicin 
complete remissions were achieved in 50% of these models. The principle is based that you have an acidic environment. Um, primarily, of course, once albumin is taken up in the endosomes and lysosomes, where the pH goes down to 4 and 5. Um, but it is also well known that solid tumors, when you measure them with pH electrodes, have a pH of around 6 to 6.8. And the half-life of this bond here, this bond here, this bond, uh, at pH 5 is only one half an hour. So it's a very rapid release. These are the clinical trials which are ongoing with our Dr. Rubison. Um, um, there are combination studies ongoing, um, once in glioblastoma. Um, this is the pivotal second-line small cell lung cancer comparing ALDOX um, against uh, topotecane in platinum-resistant patients. And this is um, the most advanced study. It's completed. It uh, was completed in November of last year. This is second-line soft tissue sarcoma, and this is the only one I will show you um, a bit more of information. Why soft tissue sarcoma? Sarcoma is not a carcinoma. It um, emerges from the connective tissue, so from joints, from uh, fat, from cartilage, from muscles, and they are very hard to treat, very difficult to treat. It's a very heter heterogeneous uh, disease, over 50 different, different subtypes. We have about 150,000 new cases per year. This is the data for the US and Europe. And the first-line treatment uh, is either doxorubicin, that is commonly used, an alternative is ifosramide. The response rate for both these drugs are poor. It's about 10 to 15 percent. So these patients very early move into second-line um, um, therapy. Um, there is no standard of care for second-line soft tissue sarcoma, and these are even more difficult to treat. Most of the affected areas are in arms and legs. This is the design of the phase three study. So it was a head-to-head -head comparison with 200 patients of aldoxorubicin at this dose. This is doxorubicin equivalent cycle every three weeks. And the comparator arm, the investigator had a choice of five different agents. Um, it started in February 2014. Logistically, it was quite a difficult uh, 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 trial to carry out. 79 sites worldwide. And um, all these patients had uh, metastatic, locally advanced or unresectable soft tissue sarcoma. Um, the endpoints were the primary ones, progression-free survival and tumor response, secondary endpoints, overall survival and safety. Now, the study has officially ended, and we have enough events to bring out data. And we're, of course, all waiting for that data. But the data, we actually blind to this study, so we, we don't know what's happening. We just know whether the study has been completed. Um, and the data for progression-free survival and tumor response will come out mid-July. So you can check the Citrix homepage if you're interested. But I can't say more than that. Now to the novel linkers. Um, the rationale behind this was actually to, to elucidate um, how could you vary the drug release rate with an acid-sensitive linker. And surprisingly, um, using the hydrozone chemistry, one saw in the literature, this had never been looked at. 
So what we designed was basically still a prodrug with a protein binding group. We added a component which uh, would render water solubility if necessary. And this is the all decisive group. It's an aromatic group, not an aliphatic one, as in aldoxorubicin, which you could substitute through different functional groups, the hydrozone bond, then the spacer, again, modulating acid sensitivity. And the, um, the drug, of course, could be anything. And it turned out, and I'm showing you now a proof of concept for the water-soluble linker. This is nemorubicin, which doesn't have a hydrochloride. It's water-insoluble. If you use a ladder, this is linker-activated drug release, which has no water-soluble component. The drug stays in water-soluble. If you add a sulfonate group, you can see that the whole construct is water-soluble in PBS. Moving on now, this is the drug, which is our phase one clinical candidate. It's a gemcitabine prodrug. This is gemcitabine, again, um, capped here with an acetylbenzoic acid. This is the ladder linker. The secret here now, the nitrogen oxide, um, um, or nitro group, sorry, this is the important one, which enhances drug stability, so the release at pH 4 is much slower than for aldox. We remain with the melamide group, and the phosphate group is important for water solubility. This is the kind of data you get. Gemcite have been directly compared to what we now have renamed the drug, DK49. We could dose uh, far lower, and what you see here, good response for both drugs w during therapy, but then after therapy, the DK49 definitely has a much better response. One other model with a tumor at a uh, larger uh, starting volume, this is now an ovarian, the one before was a non-small cell lung cancer model, again, during therapy, good response, but then you see the separation, and this is definitely statistically significant over a long time. You can see that better in, in this graph. Uh, this is day zero during randomization. This is day 67, and you see seven complete remissions um, of these eight animals in the DK49 group. And this is the last slide. And um, this is um, now what we are doing. We are uh, just in the process of tech transfer of DK49 to uh, vendors which produce this drug under GMP. And then we will go through the typical process you need to get a drug into phase one. Um, we are continuing... Um, in expanding the ladder technology and um, applying them to hemotherapeutic agents and kinase inhibitors. And the ladder technology is also being assessed if it can be used to develop antibody drug conjugates with, with highly potent drugs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I'm sure there are some questions. Then uh, maybe I have one. Um, you have done this exercise already several times with this protein uh, and, and covalently linked uh, drugs. Um, how difficult is it to bring it into clinical trials, if you talk to your authorities, is this already a, a running machinery because they know your systems and they accept it, or is it somehow difficult um, to come up with a, with a new solution? Um, not really, because it's a, I, I mean, the prodrug is, is um, a small molecule, and it's a defined drug, um, and that's all you need well, that's not all you need, but that's the most important thing which authorities look at. Do you 
have a chemically defined entity, so this is, aldoxorubicin is an NCE, a new chemical entity. It's chemically exactly defined, and if you define that, it doesn't really matter what happens in the body. Okay. So Just like we don't know what happens with aspirin. When you that's take right. It. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? So um, thanks again for your presentation.